uh, Mohammed. I think Mohammed's next. Yes. Um, so it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Mohammed Azad Khur, who's written actually quite extensively on, on the idol and, and the question of actually this problem of Abbey Standard that we started actually this afternoon with. Um, he is a professor of uh, philosophy at San Francisco State University, um, a wonderful uh, human being, and, uh, and uh, which of course is very important because professors do need to be good people uh, if we're going to affect changes in ourselves and in others. Um, so, uh, Mohammed, the, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sajjad. <laughs> that was very sweet. I <laughs> don't know if I'm worthy of all those uh, uh, attributes you gave me, but um, uh, I, I do my best. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm uh, 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 really happy to be in this uh, company. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael and Sajjad for uh, uh, inviting me and uh, really enjoyed all the, the talks uh, thus far. I'm sure I'll enjoy the last one as well. I um, wanted to share uh, some uh, thoughts I had. Uh, you asked me uh, to discuss um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the current, uh, say, trajectory of my research as it concerns Hado and the uh, and the colonial Islam, and I and I think there's a connection there. I, I thought it'd be just uh, too brief a time uh, um, block to make that connection. I'll, I'll say my thoughts, uh, my current thoughts on some of these things, and 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 hope in the conversation, if there's interest, we can uh, think of the connection a bit more. So I'll, I'll start in the order that the title of the uh, conference went, Hado. And um, uh, I'll just begin with this kind of autobiographical uh, 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 comment that in the early 90s, I, I had the good fortune of attending a, a lecture on Pierre Hado by um, uh, Michael's colleague, Arnold Davidson. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it was uh, in the early years of my graduate studies and I was in uh, the audience of uh, mainly analytic uh, pragmatists. This is a title I'll throw around uh, a number of times in the talk. Um, uh, my recollection is somewhat dim, but Davidson's uh, uh, narration of Hado's uh, approach to ancient philosophy uh, sent a shock of excitement to the audience. Uh, um, you know, uh, my uh, my fellow. Uh, uh, audience members were analytic pragmatists were and continue to be on the cutting edge of Anglo-American tradition of philosophy. Uh, um, some of you know their immediate predecessors are people like uh, uh, Quine, uh, Donald Davidson, and, and most importantly, Wilfred Sellers, who as Rorty once said, ushered analytic philosophy out of its Humean and into its Kantian stage. And <clears throat> of the people that I was uh, uh, attending this talk, um, uh, uh, embraced uh, Sellers' cosmopolitan spirit and ushered analytic philosophy into its Hegelian and one could even say Heideggerian stages. Um, for these uh, philosophers, the continental analytic divide is not an obstacle and they deftly engage the history of philosophy. <clears throat> They can, they can, just to say a little bit more about them, credited with challenging the formalist and foundationalist trends in analytic philosophy. And these trend, uh, uh, restricted the concerns of philosophy to an artificial scientific uh, language in the place of this abstract and vulnerable house of cards, uh, analytic pragmatists escort, escort us to ordinary language games and forms of life. And of course, here we already see evidence of another philosophical giant, uh, uh, Wittgenstein, whose Tractatus is the subject of a fascinating study by Hado. I'm sure some of the uh, people in the audience know about that one. Uh, Wittgenstein's tortured concerns with self-care and the bounds of ethics uh, were never marginal to a consideration of his work by scholars that belong to this analytic pragmatism like uh, Jim Conant and Cora Diamond, and Hado's, uh, Hado's study uh, provided a fascinating link between these concerns and Neoplatonism. Um, uh, so um, 
you know, I, uh, this was by way of introduction and an interesting question that I'm exploring in regard to the work of Hado um, is the history of the modern restriction of the activity of philosophy to the university and the marginalization of philosophy as a, a way of life in general. Uh, Hado uh, finds the origin of academic philosophy in the scholastic centers of learning, scholastic universities, where philosophy, according to him, became the servant of theology. Now, this bondage of philosophy is, uh, uh, you know, as you all probably know, is challenged in an unlikely place in what is enlightenment. Kant aimed to deliver the philosopher from the ancillary role and champion the university philosopher as the possessor of genuine freedom who has emerged from his so-called self-incurred tutelage or, or minority in the more recent translation. Um, but Kant's philosopher remained uh, constrained by formal norms and his successors, Hegel, Schopenhauer, and Nietzsche aimed to enrich the norms with historical and cultural content. In uh, Schopenhauer as educator, Nietzsche famously decried the Kantian philosopher for wanting to revolutionize human learning when he cannot even revolutionize himself. Uh, Nietzsche advocated the philosopher's escape from the control of the educational institutions and the state and individualized the eman emancipatory way of life. But Hegel saw the first sparks of philosophy in the shelter of uh, the state polis and traced the expansion of the state's antagonist, the, the family or the household into civil society or what Marx called political economy. And I also would say Foucault called uh, biopower. Um, the leveling effect of civil society uh, achieved partly through its educational impact, uh, universities on the subjective will is uh, sublated by the reemergence of the now improved state. Um, and this is when philosophy comes to its fruition and genuine self-determination is accompl uh, accomplished. Um, I am interested in understanding Hado's philosophy, not just as his kind of um, uh, uh, scholarship of, of ancients, but the, the framing of this approach uh, in the context of this uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, discussion, uh, the, the, uh, the modern um, engagement that perhaps you might say begins with Kant, um, and I, you know, you know, perhaps uh, you know, you could uh, help me with that a bit. But um, uh, just to sort of uh, 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 go on now to the the colonial Islam topic. Um, um, it goes without saying that Islamic philosophy is conspicuously absent from or marginalized in the discussions of history of philosophy by modern philosophers. Um, um, Peter Parks, uh, and this is a point that uh, Ulu Damini uh, also mentioned, um, uh, Peter Parks, Africa, Asia, and the history of philosophy is a fascinating study of racism and Eurocentrism in 18th century histories of philosophy with a focus on Kant and Hegel, two of the most canonical modern philosophers. It is no revelation that modern academic philosophers do not indulge the questioning of, uh, of the racism of their key figures. The proponents of the status quo complain that such concerns are ad hominem. The philosophers', the philosophers bigoted beliefs and writings based on them are irrelevant to the logical coherence and uh, soundness of their philosophical views. Scholars on the other end of the spectrum, which I would argue include you know, analytic, analytic pragmatists, uh, argue that the insulationist approach to philosophy is based on a false dichotomy and that our beliefs, theoretical and empirical, hang together. If a philosopher scales theoretical heights but fails to deliver himself from bigotry and bias in his everyday beliefs, he suffers from a false consciousness. His philosophical work is at best unstable and at worst ideological. Uh, Park does sidestep the tension between holism in this way and insulationism that I mentioned, um, 
but dedicates his work to the study of the racist views of Kant and Hegel. He focuses especially on their accounts of the origins of philosophy and shows how they went out of their way to argue that philosophy originates in, the, in Europe's alle alleged intellectual birthplace, ancient Greece, and whatever was around before was not philosophy. And moreover, the white Europeans are the true heirs to the Greeks. <clears throat> Park does not, but I, but I see a connection between Said's, uh, Edward Said's analysis of Orientalism and the racism embraced by these canonical modern philosophers. As it is well known, um, Said argued that Orientalism arises from a dynamic exchange between individual authors and the large political concerns shared by the, uh, by the three great empires, British, French, and American, in whose intellectual territory the writing was produced. Um, this so-called dynamic exchange, according to Said, characterizes, quote, the corporate institution for dealing with the Orient, dealing with it by making statements about it, authorizing views of it, describing it by teaching it, settling it, ruling over it. In other words, Orientalist discourse interpenetrates various academic disciplines and serves the project of dominating, controlling, and managing the so-called Orient for the sake of the colonial agenda. The Orient for Said is principally the Islamic Orient, and his conclusion is that as a result of the Orientalist discourse, Islam has been fundamentally misrepresented in the West. I don't mean to implicate Said in my discussion of racism of canonical modern philosophers in a superficial way. For example, one could argue that Park remains focused on the origins of philosophy and overlooks the paucity of the considerations of medieval non-European Muslim and Jewish philosophers who contributed to the development of European philosophy. Why are they conspicuously absent or played down even in the accounts which celebrate the non-European origins of philosophy. I, I don't think that's the main issue. My concern is that Park does not consider canonical racism as a product of Europe's um, colonial ambition. That is um, why his work should be read in tandem uh, with Said and uh, uh, Fanon perhaps. And, you know, and I think we'll do the Amini as well. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so th this is uh, um, something that, uh, um, you know, one could argue that uh, German philosophers like Kant and Hegel were, you know, Germany was not in, the, in a colonial uh, uh, project until later, perhaps. And, um, but, you know, I, I believe that, uh, 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 you know, uh, Kant and Hegel in some sense uh, were, you know, you might say were, mercenaries, if you will, <laughs> um, adopted and, and they become, you know, uh, canonized subsequently. Uh, but I, I, I uh, um, try to pass that point until later, maybe if, you, if there's you know, interest in discussing it. Um, at this point, at this point, in line with the installationist reading I mentioned earlier, one may insist uh, that the entanglement of some philosophers in European imperial and co colonialism does not imply that the philosophical space uh, is colonized. Because of my pragmatist leanings, however, I'm not convinced that the implication is not there, as philosophers do in fact deform the philosophical space by subordinating it to their overlooked, perhaps, political and economic agendas. Uh, these agendas are not restricted to the social tensions internal to Europe and her history, um, for example, Hegel's discussion of civil society should be expanded and developed by incorporating non-European colonies whose labor and resources, as Oluda Amini mentioned, continue to fuel the technological and cultural advancements uh, of the colonizers. Um, so in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, uh, we analytic pragmatists do much to combat the deformations of the philosophical space. Um, as a result, uh, the pos that position provides a fascinating vista for a, a, a new reading of Islamic philosophy. And in my work, I have tried to enhance that vista by 
drawing on the insights of uh, Pierre Hadot and the compatible concerns of uh, modern philosophers. Uh, much remains to be done, of course, uh, and the venerable participants in this conference are some of the scholars from whom I uh, draw inspiration and insight. Um, thank you very much. I'll stop. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I think it will take about five minutes for uh, some conversation. So um, does anyone want to begin asking? Anyone? Okay, one second. Yeah, uh, so the question is, a common critique of decolonial approaches is that the polarization of West and rest uh, occludes other valences of contrast and continuity. Whatever we think of this, might Addo do something like this with antiquity and modernity? If so, is this a strength or weakness of his approach? Okay, I, um, so I, I'm interested. I, I, I think that that's an interesting question. Um, uh, I, I think that um, as, as Michael and others have mentioned, Hadot's uh, um, uh, philosophical reach did not uh, get to um, uh, um, many non-Western traditions if, uh, uh, you know, um, at all, and even when he engaged in Neoplatonism, he, for example, didn't really address, say, Islamic uh, uh, philosophy. Um, uh, but I, but I, I agree with uh, all the other participants thus far that um, Hado's approach has uh, resources um, um, for articulating a um, a, a decolonial and and. Uh, and uh, um, uh, fair approach to non-Western traditions. Um, uh, and that's, uh, 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 you know, but one of the things that I, I, I try to raise in, in my talk, brief as it was, is what are the, some of the limitations of the way Hado for, formulates his, his position? And I think I, I agree with uh, an earlier comment, I think it was by Noman, um, Nagvi, that um, uh, that Hado has a has a kind of a voluntarist uh, 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 orientation. I think he was quoting from someone else, but I I, I see him um, more in line with kind of like a Nietzschean view. Even though you know um, he does say um, um, he may challenge some aspects of Nietzsche's take. Um, but, um, but, you know, he's, you know, uh, so he, for example, he's not so concerned about the, um, uh, the, 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 the frame, the, the political economic frame within which uh, uh, philosophical discourse uh, sort of is sheltered and, and emerges and, and is developed. And, and something that, for example, Hegel and others uh, uh, are interested in. Um, so I, 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 I think there are limitations to Hado's view, but he thematizes a, a concern in philosophy that, that you, know, uh, you know, should not be just perhaps restricted to this uh, a voluntarist uh, uh, approach, which may be his. If I could jump in, Sajad, can you hear me? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think, I mean, Hado does, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Andrew Appiah's, Anthony Appiah's talk, uh, there's no such thing as Western civilization, his wreath lecture. So he chose kind of the genealogy of the term the West uh, and the kind of nature of the colonial construction of the West, Stuart Hall also has a great essay, The West and the Rest. So Hado, I think, does fall prey to this, like everybody else, you know, pretty much in his time, in writing in terms of the West, despite the fact that West means nothing when you're talking about Greco Roman antiquity, or West means like you know, Italy, or you know. Um, so he, he does talk about a Western tradition without, at least in my limited reading, a, a kind of critical eye to the uh, origin of this 
grouping of constellations of, of, of thinkers and traditions um, and things like that. But what I think, as has been mentioned before, is, is really key is in kind of recovering or restating the, the boundaries of philosophy, the goal of philosophy, and, and the categories uh, of, of analysis and philosophical study, all of a sudden it opens up um, and you can, Hado allows us to make the argument that, okay, well, actually it's the Islamic philosophers who are the trunk, uh, who stayed true to the, <laughs> the nature of philosophy. And it was the modern Europeans who were heretical deviants. <laughs> I mean, there's sort of some people go that far, that, that, that word branches. Whereas usually it's presented as there's the, the root in ancient Greece, it develops in uh, you know, Latin Christendom, it gets tossed to the Muslims for a while, then they toss it back and then you know, goes to Paris and London and then to the Washington DC. Um, but Hadot's conception, reconception of philosophy allows for re new histories of transmission and new histories of philosophy, or at least allows those new histories to be more, more legible, um, I think, which I think is, is very important. Oh, sorry, yeah, my, my, I have music to keep my daughter quiet. Sorry if it's disturbing. That's absolutely fine, absolutely fine. Uh, you know, it's, it's actually a very good example of why, you know, philosophers don't live in disembodied existences. You know, we're very much <laughs> society and this is important. Uh, uh, there are, there is a comment in the chat from Istran and I know um, uh, there was a hand up from Muhammad, but if you can both just hold on to the end, because I want to really check, go to the final presentation now uh, with Lisa. Um, and then, uh, you know, when, when Noor does his, her summing up, we'll come back to you, Mohammed, and come back to his friend. And also when we sum up, I'd also really like to hear from Michael, Michael Nafe as well. Um, um, I'd like to hear what you have to say at the end as well. So um, if we can, uh, thank you, Mohammed, if we can move on to, uh, to Lisa now. Um,